Okay, as we, uh, you know, we covered a lot of bit of it, you know, it's sort of hard in, in an hour from last week to cover all of the, the basic principles of, of art of Star Wars because it's something that evolves over time, you know, and, and I put all of this up here for you guys. I hope you're able to take a look at it because the one thing that reigns true, I was talking to a buddy of mine actually after our class was done on Tuesday last week and we were talking about the simplicity and he even made a comment. He goes, man, I wish I could do that because he learned a tremendous amount from going back and looking at Ralph, Ralph McQuarrie and a bunch of the original artwork because a lot of the artwork is really... It's based off of just really simple principles and reads versus a lot of artists that are out there right now tend to overcomplicate everything and push things and they add too much detail and take things to a different level. So, you know, when you're looking at this, hopefully that large, medium, and small sort of stuck in the back of your brain. But what I thought I'd do really quick is I just talk a little bit about part of that thumbnail process. And, you know, w without a doubt from years of just teaching and art and drawing, I, and I even brought my sketchbook here. It's my thumbnail sketchbook for environments because I was sketching out some ideas for things. Um, every time I, I sit down to do an environment, I'm just, uh, I'm, you know, without a doubt, the one aspect of drawing that has increased my ability the most has been drawing in a sketchbook, and it's been thumbnailing constantly. In fact, producing a bunch of little drawings has gotten me to a much higher level of design and drawing than anything else, and, and I couldn't think of what... I would do if I didn't have my, you know, this ability to create constant thumbnails like one after another. It, it, without a doubt, it's one of the most pivotal things that that increased my ability to draw. So one of the things I thought I'd talk about really quick is just setting up part of your thumbnail right. Then you'll notice in a lot of that Star Wars concept art that we were looking at, they had really low angle shots. And um, without a doubt, that's probably one of the most important things that you're going to notice. The other thing that I wanted to sort of mention to you guys about was starting off, whenever I'm sketching, I'm always drawing a rough grid. And I still have students to this day, whenever I teach them the environment design class, they want to skip this phase. Um, and it's without a doubt probably the most important phase that there is in drawing. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, uh, for me, the great thing about starting with a really simple grid like this is, let me zoom in there really quick, is as soon as I look at this, um, I am automatically see a, a transfer of depth and space that's in there. And so I can quickly, you know, the way I, my brain works is I can imagine like a rock formation being in here like this, and then I can imagine that rock formation landing back here in the middle being somewhere else like this, being smaller. And so basically what that is, that term in perspective is called transferring scale. And so basically what it means is whenever we have this height relationship of somebody about this big here, we can easily look back to our sketch and we can figure out the height of that person right here is going to be about that tall. So the transferring scale is a huge issue because I could immediately figure out the size of my buildings. I can figure out the size of spaceships or people. And it, without a doubt, it's a huge um, attribute towards drawing correctly. The next thing that comes after that transferring a scale would be this. Let me back up there a couple steps. Okay, let me go back for a minute. Take that off. The next part that comes in is the power of overlap. And what overlap is, is if I have an object that's here in the front, and then this is overlapping part of this other object that lands here, that's going to create more depth inside my piece. And the same thing would happen even if it's a hill. If I have like a hill that's coming down and landing on part of my ground plane, I could then come back in here and have another hill, and I can figure out where it's hitting. And if I really zoom into this, you can see, let me go to red real quick, that I still have all this distance from here to here to add more detail inside my environment that's going to make it feel a little bit more uh, realistic. Okay, so um, let, me, let me go back for a minute there. Let me take these off. So basically what that means is once I have this grid plane that's there, what I'm thinking of in the back of my brain is I'm always doing this. I'm thinking of that's my foreground line. Anything that lands here and comes towards me is going to be a foreground element. And then I'm going to have a line about right here, and this is going to be the distance from there into here is going to be sort of my midground space. And then this, even though it looks like it's not that much, but this little depth 
for just from here to here. That's part of my very background. Now, technically, I, I sort of have two backgrounds when I'm sketching because I have this background, which is on the perspective plane. So that's really common. We A lot of people refer to this plane right here is your Z depth or your perspective plane. Okay. There's another background, which might be like the mountains or the graphic shapes of trees that would be, let's say, like back in here that you might see. So technically, you could still have that large element in the back, and it's still considered part of a background. But I think of that as more as a backdrop background, if that makes sense, right? And then the last thing that you always have that a lot of people forget, which is still on a plane, is your sky plane. So you have this sky. If I were to draw like this and come over here and throw another grid up to that vanishing point, everything that I just drew down below still exists up top because I have an entire sky plane that's up there. And with that sky plane, there's a lot, all the same principles that happen down below apply to the upper part as well. So I, I have transfer of scale. I have overlap to create depth. So in fact, what I could do, imagine if I had a series of clouds in here that look like this. As my clouds recede, I want to be able to make my clouds look like they're getting a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. And then just having three clouds like that, that's going to increase my visual read of perspective happening. So whenever you're doing a thumbnail, outside of following with, there's the, the, the design principle of Star Wars and what they do. But then on top of that, it's also understanding what's happening in terms of perspective. And there's like, you know, there's basically three fundamental issues here that are always happening that a lot of students tend to forget. And part of that is, is they're really understanding that this is that Z depth and this is that relationship where everything is um, getting smaller as it goes backwards. Understanding how to separate your foreground to midground to background, understanding that this right here can be a backdrop, uh, just a graphic shape of mountains or hills, which would still exist. And then also understanding that this right here is technically, you need to think of that as a sky plane. Okay, not plane, but P-L-A-I-N. Now my erasing doesn't work either. Okay, so I hope that makes sort of sense um, because that's really a great way that we establish a lot of depth. So if you come back and you take a look, at some of these pieces, you can see that here. For example, if I were to draw on top of this, which I'm just fine with doing, if that helps break down what's happening here. But let me just move this little, here, let me save this really quick to the desktop and we'll open it up and I'll draw on top of it. And I'll show you exactly what's happening. <clears throat> there it is, it's saved. Let me grab another one too. Um, that's another one, great one as well. Save picture assets, put that on the desktop, save. Okay, so let me bring those open really quick in Photoshop. Let me turn those off. It's important to do this because this is part of really um, breaking down uh, a drawing and understanding the fundamentals behind it and what's taking place. And without a doubt, I think, you know, from being in, just being a teacher for all these years, from being at different schools, um, and then also just from, you know, working in the industry and being around you know, young students coming in, this is the, everyone wants to jump to like the sweet spot, which is the digital painting and the rendering, and they want to crush it there, but they're forgetting the golden aspect, which is this, which is if I were to dissect this up, here's my horizon line that's in there, right? And we just talked about the transfer of scale. So look, even if I come back here really lightly, and if I come back down to that horizon line, look at the height of this guy right here. And if I come back and pick a vanishing point, and I recede the height of that and recede it back. Look at what happens when we hit right here. That's exactly the height of that cannon being that much lower. Okay. Um, and then if you look at this, let me back up there for a minute. If you look at this and you look at this structure, it comes down here. It anchors itself down to part of the midground. So this is actually pretty much in the midground. And then you have this structure here which connects to this, but that's coming down into the foreground. So what they're basically doing is they're taking you on a ride like this with a bunch of lines and wrap you around. That's the line that's creating all the detail in there. So even though they're blending it together, it's still a form of overlap, just that when they painted this, the only thing that happened is that they just painted this from here to here. And even when in doing that, you'll even notice this is about like an inch and a half, then it goes down to an inch, then it goes a little smaller, 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 where they even try to get some of the detail to properly recede back, matching 
that principle of the transfer of scale. So again, that you know, one of the key foundational rules of perspective is as things recede, they get smaller from you. It happens with railroad tracks, it happens with squares, it happens with everything, okay? And if we take a look at this one too, it's actually the same thing. There's your horizon line. It's really, it's down really low, okay? And here, there's not a lot of foreground elements, but if you just were to come back over here, we land right in the middle here, we have a, a nice ellipse that's centered there. And if we follow that straight up, that's connecting and up to the top of the ceiling. And that's basically in the midground. And then basically, if you think about it, if you, in perspective, this is how you would figure this out. Technically, that ship is our foreground element. Because if you were to come back from a vanishing point and draw a line across, and if you were to draw a line from the bottom of that and bring it right down here, that's the closest item that's to us right there. Okay, and then if you come back here, and if you were to come back and draw a line going this way, and then if you were to draw a line and see where this hits the ground plane, it's right about there. So this ship in the back is definitely, oops, a little bit of slip there. It's landing behind the midground. So basically how they structured this was foreground, midground, background, elements. So that's three elements. And then this, you can think of that as that's flat level on the horizon line. And you should really break that down into considering that to be the very back that's what I called it like a sky plane or the background plane because that's what it is. And by the way, it's also the same thing if you're, if you're looking at 3D and if you look at any Pixar movie, they're going to have modeling in the front. So the foreground and the midground is going to be a modeled set in Maya. And then the backdrop is going to be a backdrop painting that's painted in by a concept artist. So in order to do that properly in Maya and in any scene like in what we can do today, I can actually pull up a scene or two and I'll show you the backdrop paintings that are in there because it's sort of the same principle that applies to this. The golden rule is you have to have that low horizon line because it makes it easier to stack stuff on top of each other and you just have to think about how to separate your planes. But what a lot of students don't get, here let me back up there real quick, is when you see this work, <coughs> what a lot of students don't understand is they're looking at this as, oh that's just like this piece of concept art and they're not seeing that there is this dedicated grid that's right here, okay? And with that grid landing down, there is a series of depth that's taking place from the foreground to the midground. And the way you figure that out in perspective, we know that ship is right there because if we draw a line, and it well, basically if you come from the center of that ship and you bring it down, you're not quite sure where it's gonna hit, but you can tell by this because the center of this large instrument panel is hitting uh, if this, excuse me, this round ellipse shape is hitting right there in the middle, you know this is closer, so it's going to be hitting somewhere about right here. Another reason why that is important, let's say you're working on this piece, this is more of a perspective issue, and your art director says they want the light source to come from the left side. If that was the case, and if light was coming down from this way, then you would be able, that's how we would figure out, you would draw a line from here, coming down here, being parallel, and that's how you would figure out where, let me do this in blue real quick, um, that's how you would figure out how the shadow of this Millennium Falcon would be hitting. It'd be hitting right there on the ground based off of the position of where it is above that grid. Does that make sense? So there's another reason why that grid is super duper important. You just can't bypass it and, and skip over that. It's a huge part of the way that you construct and you make something. Okay. All right. So um, does that help when I draw over those Star Wars drawings and sort of explain what's going on? Because the, to me, that's one of the greatest exercises that you can do of all time uh, is break down the grid and perspective that's happening underneath. Because technically, all we're really doing is you're going in and you're painting, your digital painting, and digital paint is actually this simple. It's just a local color. On top of that local color, you're going to have a texture. You're going to have detail. And then you're going to have shadows and highlights. Shadows and highlights are going to be predicated upon the direction of the light source. That's it. So all you have to do is break it down in that simple sort of rhythm. And then it makes sense. But you can't apply the paint unless you have things properly structured. Okay. Resume. Okay. So here's a good example of why that the gridding foundation is so important. Okay, so there's a piece of concept art that's actually from Naughty Dog, which is here in Santa Monica, okay, and this is Rob Ruppel. So if you take this, it looks pretty complex. There's a lot of detail. There's a lot of stuff going on, right? However, though, if we break that down, that's actually what's happening in there, okay? 
it's that's the horizon line. You can see the vanishing point, which is right here in the center of that screen, right? And then you could see all of these grids going in there. And then even the typology, meaning the if you typology is a term we use in Maya, if you think of mountains and rocks, that's still typology. It's still geometry. It's just a bunch of lines with mesh wrapped around it that makes it feel realistic. To me, what irks me is every time back in the day when I was learning how to paint digitally and do stuff, no one ever talked about this stuff. And this to me is the most important stuff because in order to really understand how paint and light and shadow affects an object, you have to understand where its placement is inside perspective. And you can't figure that out until you're able to go in and you can, you can figure out a grid like this. So, and that's only going to happen in part of your thumbnail and part of your design phase. You're going to be able to really break things down and think about how they exist in terms of perspective. And then even when we get back here, do you, if we were to count this out, you see how the, let me go back to the piece. So the troops are in the foreground with this rock here. So that's the foreground elements, right? Then if you come back over here and you look at this, so your midground is pretty much like from here all the way back to about here. Then you have buildings in perspective that are sort of stacked up above this. And technically, just to be honest with you, it's a little bit of a cheat because if your vanishing point is right there in the middle and you're in one point perspective, you're going to be looking at the left-hand side of the buildings. Does that make sense? Excuse me, the right side, we're looking at the left right now. But let me go back to the painting then. So what that means is look at this, but this is possible in perspective. This ground layer is in one point perspective and now the buildings are turned at two point. Do you see that? Because technically if your vanishing point, you see the road and goes to right here, okay? That's technically one point perspective, which means if that point's in the middle and we're looking at buildings, the buildings being to the left hand side, we would see the right side of the buildings if they were drawn. I'm going to not say that they're drawn incorrectly, but the artist turned them at a two point counter angle. So if you're looking at them from a top view, there would be a road that would go like this, so it would be straight, and the buildings technically would be arched at a little bit of an angle. Because in perspective, you can have things that exist in one point and two point. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, it would be on the same horizon line. So in a good example of that would be if I'm standing right here and I'm looking at this room right now, it's in one point perspective to me. But if I look at Eric's iPad, it's turned in an angle, that's in two point. So things can exist in one point and two point, not just to answer that. Yes, you can turn things, they still exist on the same vanishing point until you pick up an object and tilt it. Once it tilts, it then has a new vanishing point at a different angle that's counterproductive to it, if that makes sense. Okay, so if we come back here, it's the same thing here. Where's our horizon line on here? It's up super high. I, I think I'm going to do more of these. I'm going to make this, this is one of the things I'm going to transition into a perspective assignment in the perspective class um, coming up for this term. Because, I mean, we look at things and what you're seeing here is all the painting on the top and all the prettiness of it. But what you're not seeing is all the grid and the overlay and the way that everything's arranged. And that's the perspective of that scene is this right here. Okay, that's right. It is in two point because you can see that there are angles of that uh, mountain top going this way and they're angling this way. And then if we go back to the painting, you can see it in the buildings. The buildings have a left side and a right side. So it's going this way and it's going that way. But what's the, another reason why, which is a great example of why that's so important, is you can see what is where the light's coming from and where's the light side and the dark side, right? So... Um, the light side of this mountain is that side, that's the dark side. So it's the same thing with the buildings, light side, shadow side. So all that makes sense because artists that, if you go to Art Center College of Design back in like the golden days, this is one of the first things they, they would do is you would sit down and you would produce pages and pages of thumbnails. They had a little roller, ruler, have you seen those? They had a little roller on them, you would roll that up and down and you would just take a black pen, like a micron pigma, and you'd make little thumbnails and you'd hit it with markers and you would do countless thumbnails, one after another after another, until you would fill pages of ideas and thoughts. Okay, So that's pretty much with the same process of where this is going. This is another image from Sparth. Okay, So if you break down, the, the difference is, is that Sparth and, and Rupal and these other artists, they've done this so many thousands of times, the perspective's ingrained in their brain. They know it's there. They're always thinking about it. The difference between you, the newbie, is that you're not thinking about that. 
you're on purposely diving into, oh, this looks really great, and I got a character in the middle, I'm going to render it out, but you're forgetting what part of that staging is and what the grid plane is doing, okay? And this is a huge part. So when I go to draw, this is one of the first things that I do in my sketchbook. As I sit down there, you can look at almost any of my drawings, and you're going to see that I have like a, a rough little grid or a space arrangement, and then I go in there and I start blocking in my shapes, Okay, so that would be your proper structure as you get into something. You have to really understand where's my horizon line, how am I looking up or down at something, and how is it sort of making sense. Here's another piece from Spart that does the exact same thing. You can see exactly where these lines go. So just looking back here, where's the horizon line in this piece? It's way back here, okay? We're sort of looking down on top of things. So technically, you could say... If we're looking back on these mountains, the horizon might be about here. Because if you look at that castle, um, well, the castle's receding back a little bit here. So the horizon line's probably up about here. But he, what he did is he cuts that off in the grid. So you have the ground plane going this way. And then uh, basically you have all these mountains overlapping each other to create depth. So your, your typology goes up these mountains, down and around until you get up to here. And then you can see the sky coming down. So... Um, the angle of this building, your horizon line is probably about right here. But it's a little tricky because you can't really tell that when you're first looking at it. Okay, So um, the reason why that's so important is that it, you can look at the foreground here and you have to realize like the, the perspective and understanding the gridding and the typology of what you're drawing has to deal with where you're going to put your detail when you're digitally painting. right? So if you know where your foreground is, your foreground element isn't going to have a ton of detail because that's probably not where your eye is going to be going. Your foreground elements are there to create composition to, or to enhance the composition. They're there to act as what are called visual leads, which, which are mean directional angles that point you in to where we want to look. Another purpose of having something is the purpose of principle of overlap and scale. So by having this large building in front and having someone very small standing down here, that's going to just show the, the mag, it's going to magnify the size relationship and scale of the world. So when you look at that, you're immediately going to think like, wow, this place has got to be huge if somebody here is, is that small. And you could, and by the way, you could change that. If you made somebody in here about three inches tall, it would totally ruin the whole scale. It would ruin the whole piece. It would change everything. Okay, so it's really important to think about this and figure this out. So I know some of you in this coming up for this winter break, it was going to be focused on digital painting. And it was for you guys. I had students in prop that wanted to paint their props. I have some students in narrative illustration that wanted to also continue working on some other projects. They both overlap each other, but this is the foundation really for getting into painting of environments is you have to understand without this step, you're missing everything. You have to have the perspective grid and it has to make sense and it has to come together. Okay. All right. So um, what I was going to do here is I was just going to sketch out. I had a couple ideas in my sketchbook that I was sketching on and I was just going to go back in here and show you how I pretty much started. Okay. But I know I threw a lot of things at you really quickly just to go over that. But this is how my brain works when I'm drawing. As soon as I come down here, let me label my work here real quick. As soon as I start working, you know, I always have a separate box. I come down here and I throw in my grid and then I just dive into it and I start figuring out how to construct my shape. So one of the compositions that I already thought about working on earlier, I don't know why, for some reason my brain kept going to like this desert scene with like the Jawas. I just kept, because the Jawas are great because they're so small. So if I were to do a shot like this, what I would do in here is I might come in here and I might sketch up an idea for the height of my Jawas. Maybe there's like two guys here talking and then I might come over here somewhere to the side and I might have this large sort of structured vehicle or it, it doesn't even have to be a vehicle. It could even be a base of some kind that could be sort of centered out and I might even break it into some little parts throw a couple other lines here, just try to get an interesting silhouette shape that might be in there, okay? So if that might be part of my structure, so if I have these little Jawa characters and it looks like they're walking into the city, then I have to fill up the rest of my painting. So to me, that's the fun part where I just think about foreground, midground, and background. So if I have this city that's back here, I might have part of a series of mountains that lead into it. I might have mountains that come in here. I might overlap it somehow. So if I throw in some type of mountain that's over in front of this mountain, and if I were to wrap this with a grid, it's going to look something like this. 
and then it might have part of that mountain lead back into this, and this might have a typology that sort of set something like this. Okay, then I could still come back into this. Now, I'm going back to that large, medium, and small, right? So I'm thinking about that in the back of my head. The large would be part of the environment. The medium would be this shape right here. And then the small would be the characters in the front, okay? And then I might even come in here. There's, remember, with typology and ground planes, you could still, I could still do this and have a ground plane coming in the front like this and could have something overlapped. And that would totally make sense. That would still work, but I'm creating depth by doing that. Do you see how I created that depth? By having something in the front like this and spacing in between both, it's going to immediately give you an idea that the items here on this hill in the foreground are larger. And the way I could simpl simplify that is, look, I can make a rock here in the foreground, one here, one like here, and I can make them larger. And then as the rocks go back here, all of a sudden they get a lot smaller. So just even something really simple as rock detail and some other linear items, uh, or excuse me, items stacked in a linear format where we see that transition of scale, that's going to really push part of my format. So do you see how I could take that thumbnail, thumbnail now and I could develop it more? So I just have a rough sketch. It took me a matter of minutes. The perspective's correct. I could come back in and then figure out, you know, what kind of structure this is. Maybe there's something really cool on it. Maybe there's something round on it that attaches in here. Maybe there's other little buildings and little structures and little windows that overlap in part of the front here. And then I can make this into like a some type of large city building that Jawas are going into to do trade or whatever. Okay. But if I just keep it simplified like that, and if I use that grid to build everything up, it starts to work very, very well and it's, and it's really easy. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions about that? Which one was your big medium? Which one was what? So on this, I was, the whole environment itself would be like the large. The backdrop. Yeah, the backdrop. And then, well, even if I incorporate, if I were to blend these mountains, okay. fade them into the painting, okay. that would be my large shape. Then this would be my medium. And then the characters would be my small, you know. Okay. So that's how I start. So what I thought I would do is just do this part. And then I'm going to pause it right here again. Okay. So one of the things that I do just so it's on the recorder so I can give this to you guys today, is I overcomplicate. I add too much detail. And some of that comes from a bad habit of rendering where you want to just keep adding things, but it's actually quite the opposite. And I think that's why the Star Wars work is such a challenge is sometimes you just leave it alone. It's literally like a small ship chasing a large ship with a large item behind it. That's it. You're done. It doesn't have to be anything more complicated than that. And if you come in and you take a look at some of my thumbnails that I have in here, I just have a way of adding too much detail sometimes and getting into little areas that I don't need to. So, but I know that could be different because if I was working on a doing concept for another project, it's going to have a different style. So, for example, working on Lego and doing environments is a different style. Working on something that might be game related, that's futuristic, might be a different style. And, and Star Wars has its own style too. But cinematically, Star Wars, when you look at all that art that we put up last week, it's very simple art. And it's really a, just a great exercise for you guys as students to think about when do I leave it alone. So just when you're drawing and sketching, always just think about large, medium, small, leave it alone. It, the rest, it'll, it'll answer itself on its own and you don't have to get too much more complicated than what it is. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Here, let me... I know, right? <laughs> the, the other thing is I'm sitting here sketching, working on these. The other thing I like to do, too, is, you know, you can shift your vanishing point. You know, I just do it really rough like this. Just get your line dropped in. And look, by shifting that point to one side, that's going to really change the flow of that composition. Because, look, if you let me just draw it like this in red, and then I'll take it off. So what I've done now is I've divided my space into that. So by moving that vanishing point over, I now have 70% here and I have 30% here. 
So that's really going to change part of that flow. So there are times when this would work and it wouldn't work. In Star Wars and with buildings, it's totally going to work because what I can do is I could have like a little hill and I could have a character or two standing right here. And then they're looking down. You see that 70% of distance allows them the scale moves you all the way into here. So then where that's a benefit is for me then to come in and then I could have some cool like castle like structure way back in here so it's doing a couple things by doing that number one it's shifting the piece all the way to the left side it creates a little bit more compositional balance it's still one point perspective i can still have a ton of overlap where i can have something here something there even something back here and i could still have other mountains and stuff that lead into part of the composition okay but you see how it it just feels a little better because it's weighted out, there's a distribution of mass happening when you do that 70-30 split, okay? That, that is actually <laughs> quite fun. Now, where that doesn't work, just to quickly go over this, where that doesn't work is if I had to do like the interior of a building or if I had to do something that was in really in-depth perspective because what's happening, those of you that have had that perspective class, if I come over here and draw a square right now, my square over here is going to look like that. Okay, so if I come right back over here and if I draw that same square, my square right here is going to look like this. Okay, does that make sense? So what's happening in perspective, why we wouldn't want to use this shot for certain like types of shots is because um, everything past right here is out of the cone of vision to the right side. So once we get everything out there, and that's the example, is that look at this square here. That looks correct. It looks like a square. This square here has acute and obtuse angles. It's totally distorted because it's pushed far to the right side. So where that's not going to work is if I had the interior of a building or a warehouse, or if I had maybe a large structure in the front leading to another structure with lots of architectural detail, that might be a bad choice. Where it is going to work is compositionally is doing something for like Star Wars, you know, where I could have this hill and I could have like two very small characters up on top and then I could come back here and I could really make this very cool castle-like large structure in the back here that's just like a really dominant element and then just by overlapping a couple shapes in front of it here and here maybe I can another thing I like to do is to avoid the straight lines is just to put a little bit I got this of course from Edgar Payne back in the day he'd use S curves and circular curves so what I could do is I could put a, like a little bit of a road that comes in here and it might sway this way and then come back again and that's that S happening that takes you inside a part of that composition and then technically it could even come up here and wrap over part of that hill like this and then I could move my characters up to like the edge and have them walking in like that. So what's going to happen is now if I were to do that the um, the character scales here and you can see part of the thickness of like this road coming over that hill then I just need to make sure this road down here gets a little bit smaller. What that means is that I'm changing the compositional uh, the scale transformation. So let me draw that in red for you. That means if this right here is the thickness of that road I want to try to make sure that this road appears to be a little bit thicker. So all I have to do is come in here widen a little bit of this road here put a rock or two in front of it, have it fade off, and then you can see by looking at that, that's a lot wider. And then as long as this gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it recedes, I'm now using perspective again to reinforce that transition of scale, which is huge. So um, I, I, some of you guys will be in perspective, and I'll be talking about this, this term. But a couple ways that we create depth inside a piece the first one we talked about earlier, it's that transition of scale of something being larger in the front and getting smaller. The second way we do it is by overlap. So I need to start thinking to myself, what can I use to overlap items? And if I have a hill that's set here in the foreground like this with characters on it and rocks, there's no reason why I couldn't have another hill like coming down here and landing in the middle. And you can instantly see that this hill is going to be a larger shape then look, I still am following that principle of Star Wars where I have, heck, I could even get away. I could have a, I have the whole environment as the larger element. This would be my medium element. And then my small could be the, uh, the characters that are right here walking in part of the foreground. 
okay? But there's a structure for that. And you have to be able to talk yourself through part of that structure and get that to make sense. Because if you do that, then your drawing is going to start to make sense and it's going to start to come together, okay? To me, that's one of the, the great things about sketching and drawing and figuring all this stuff out and making it work is it's not just throwing stuff on paper. You have to go in there and visually think about what you're doing. It's, it's almost like creating a little bit of a, what's the word? It's like creating a, a, a mathematical you know, um, equation where things have to make sense, right? You can't just go in and throw stuff all over because when you do, it starts to look like mayhem and then part of the buildings don't look right anymore, you know? Like this idea of like these large tusks coming up out of the ground and maybe there's like an old ruined wall and there's another one here coming out there <coughs> in the back. And it's, you know, maybe it's like an old city that's been through tons of battles. And having those, those angles in it too, those large tusks, what am I indicating that it's happening over there at that building? Is that a place where nice people hang out at? No. That's a place where there's going to be bad guys because I'm putting in triangular shapes. It's going to reinforce my composition that something evil is existing over here. And then the rest is just about me figuring out, you know, the little details that go on in this building and what the structures might be. So what's funny is that, you know, that this shape here in the back that's right there, I, I could sit and draw that. I could do a thumbnail of that and draw that 10 times over, right? I can come up with the idea of, of what that building is going to be. What's important is that I just have that visual arrangement of large, medium, small, foreground, mid-ground, background, you know, and just keep it simple. And with this being a desert, I like that idea of they're like being just these sand dunes. Sort of in the back and and there's some type of like cloud structures sitting over part of the desert, you know? So that's your backdrop. And that'd be a part of my backdrop. And this is where I got to watch because once I start putting in some of these graphic representations of the clouds, the piece will start to get very, the thumbnail might start to look very heavy and detailed. I don't want it to get too detailed, right? But that, but you could solidify that in the painting, right? You could make that blend in because that could be just a blue sky that we're putting elements into, you know, like that. And just sort of leave it alone and then just go to the next one and see what you come up with. So on this, the the environment would be the background is really large. Um, yeah, medium would be the city. And I'm thinking medium would be the city. Now I do. That's a good point. So um, actually, after you do a thumbnail, that's where I come back and I examine. So here's something I don't like. Mark is look at this. Look at the distance from here to here, and then look at the distance from there to there. Hmm. See how they're somewhat similar. Yeah. So it would be in my best interest then to perhaps take part of this and end it easier. So what I could do, since I'm in Photoshop, and it just takes a matter of seconds, is it would be, so if I were to take this right here and hit transform, what if I scaled that down a little bit more and made it a little bit smaller, like that? Now it doesn't compete with mm. the width of there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, oops, deselect. So now if I just bring these, oops, So now if I just bring these lines back over to where they were. Yes, but see now this this in the characters being right here, hmm. it's a lot less, hmm. it's not nearly as combative sure. as it was before. So now that's the dominant sort of shape and read, you know, <laughs> that's in there. Yeah. 
And there are times in Star Wars too, when you go look at that art, where they're actually doing the op. I mean, they're not. They're ditching the environment. They just put like simple blue background. Because I could, if that was the case, that could be large. I could still put another medium element in here. Like I could have a ship or something, or something else that I, I could do with it too. But you know, um, now I can. I don't know why Photoshop isn't working. It's being really touchy. Probably because of that new license thing. So did you guys hear some of the good news? The good news is, is we're switching, well, semi-good news until it works right. We're switching to a, Photoshop is going to be coming um, uh, cloud-based completely. And the good news of that is that means that if you have your student email, you'll be able just to get on a computer and log in, and your student email will grant you access. And if I'm right, that means you could be at home and then just log into Photoshop and use your student email, and you wouldn't have to pay that fee anymore. And, and it should be all cloud-based, so it should be based off, as long as you're a student here, you should be able to log in and get quick access to it. Yeah, that'd be really cool. That's something, because apparently they're realizing, I think, with their old version of 6 and stuff, how do you make, it's, it's in their best interest to make things more cloud-based and to make them work that way, because then you could log in, and then I think they allow you to run Photoshop on up to two machines at the same time. Mm. Like you could put it on a laptop and maybe it on a home desktop. And then as long as you're only using one at a time, that would work. But you have to log in every time to the cloud system. You have to create an account, which would be part of your email here at school, and you'd be good to go, mm. which is pretty cool. All right, so what I'm going to do in, in part of this demo is I'm sitting here with one of my students, Mark Hassan, and we're talking about um, what happens if you just build the environment around the prop. And that's absolutely 100% something that can be done uh, <clears throat> without a doubt because um, you can look into some of these and what you're going to notice is you might have the prop and you can actually build part of the environment around it. So, you know, here you have this direct upshot. You, you're looking at the vehicle itself. And so you just figure out that vehicle first. Everything else will be, suppl everything will be supplemental to that prop design. So if we wanted to, I think this is a great example. Um, <clears throat> even this was a great example. You have this crash ship here. You could sketch the character in there and then just put something in the back. So let's do that in a little sketch. Let's come over here. Let's do the same thing. Go really low horizon line. I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to put something in just a really light grid off to the side. Let's do it all freehand, make it real simple so it's easy to see. That grid is so, I have so many students that skip the grid. <clears throat> the grid is like the most important part because it's the part that you really see part of the detail at, right? Um, and it gives you that. As soon as I put that grid in there, my brain just goes, oh, I can see the depth. I can see what's happening in just a second. So <clears throat> let me come back to that. Let me think in here. Let's pretend we have a, I don't know, it's some type of a vehicle here. So let me just come over here and I'm thinking about, I don't know what kind of vehicle, though. I'm not I'm just throwing my head at it. So let's pretend we have a ship here of some kind. So maybe there's, I don't know, maybe there's something here, maybe part of the ship. I'm going to try to match it off to part of the perspective here. Maybe another part of the ship. Maybe something's here. Maybe it comes out. Maybe it rounds up here. Maybe there's a little front fade to it or something up there. <coughs> As long as part of the perspective feels correct on what we're sketching and bringing out. <clears throat> and this would be, I think, without a doubt, the benefit of going in and doing lots of these little sketches and really figuring out what it is that you want to make, you know, in terms of the detail and the <clears throat> what I'm going to do on this last part. Let's come back here, try to really get this to... That one up to the middle there. That one should be a little bit more of an angle. Oops. <coughs> My eraser isn't working anymore. So that's a pretty cool ship shape, right? 
excuse me. So if I had that ship shape and then I want to design around it, I well, I have two options here. Let me put them on different layers here. One of them is I thought of coming over here and throwing like something in the foreground here just to go opposite this. And if I had a character, maybe it had like a couple hills, one in the foreground, maybe something back here in the midground. And if I, it looks like there's a character that might be standing somewhere up in here, maybe sort of looking back at that ship, that might balance it a little bit more. And then I could literally just build, I, mean, I could put something in the foreground here. I can put something that lands sort of underneath the ship here that reinforces where the ship is, <clears throat> like that, having the sand under it. And then I could come in and look, I could just put like, imagine if I had ro rock structures, tall rock mountains that lead into this. So compositionally, anytime you go up or out of the screen, these lines are directional lines and they're gonna bring you back into part of that piece, sort of sway you back. So I could do that. <clears throat> Another option that I could do if I take that off, come back is, <clears throat> I was thinking of reframing this maybe a little bit, but what if I had more balance it out? What if there was, part of me wanted to come in right like this, have a hill like up in here and just have a character right in there. Yeah. Yeah. But a little bit smaller to really push the size of that, you know? Yeah. Maybe there's like a rock ledge, yeah. like up above here in part of the foreground. Maybe that character looks like they're hidden a little bit. <clears throat> type of thing. Hmm. And just imagine if, if that's all in there and you have the ship and then imagine back down here well, what if they're like unloading? It's this huge ship. Because look at the scale of somebody to there. So what if down here we see like like vehicles and, and it looks like they're unloading and it's like, you know what I mean? Like they're planning an attack or something. <clears throat> that composition could totally work as well and get into there. And maybe here it just needs to be something. Maybe we have like a half moon, a little another moon there, and then we have clouds would be rendered up, you know, supporting some of that. <clears throat> so, I mean, look, at there's two different ideas there where we're supporting the ship itself. So we're drawn around the ship. We drew the prop first. And that's just in one point perspective. Imagine if we drew the ship in a two point perspective. I could have, you know, oops. <clears throat> I actually don't like that guy. Some of my people look like Gumby people. He should be a little bit smaller. That's another thing, too, is that the scale is huge. Because if he's, like, if that guy's that big there, it changes the whole scale. Because that means back by the ship, if he were to transfer that scale, he's going to be about that tall back there. It makes that ship diminish in size. But if I come back in, and if his scale is um, only about yay big in the foreground somehow, then that ship becomes gigantic, you know? Yeah, pretty much. And then this would be, you know, part of the... Yeah. So, I mean, to me, that's, I mean, that's really a great, because we could do more of those, where we're building up that composition there. And then here, we have something even, <coughs> even different, you know? I actually like that one a little bit better, like it's in the middle of the desert. So <clears throat> it's funny is it with Star Wars, there's actually that whole entire book on the vehicles. Have you seen that one? They have a giant book that's like an inch and a half thick. It's like super thick, and it's all about the purpose of all the different vehicles that they have. Oh, the cross-section. Yeah, and it's a lot of it's, no, there's a cross-section book. There's another one all on the vehicles. It's pretty good. I mean, it looks like it's like detailed drawings and everything so you could really so what if I'm just curious what if we're to do the same sketch what if imagine if we had something set like a two point what if we had a really low horizon line and what if we saw a ship so if we come way off of these <clears throat> vanishing point let me come back there put a VP 
somewhat back there because I don't want them to be too close or else we <clears throat> ruin sort of that cone of vision, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine if we had, I don't know, let's imagine some large ship shape. in here and it's landed and it's a two point shot or whatever. Other ships tend to always break uh, design, you know what I mean? Yeah. Break shape, they have something mm -hmm. that pops out of them or whatever. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is like a smuggler ship, right? Say we have that <coughs> shape there, right? And what's funny is I could, <coughs> excuse me, I could make that smaller and fit it into. But I'm just wondering, what if it larger? If I come back here, oops, the slip there. What if I had a? Because this is something they would do. If you go back and look at some of their language, they would probably come in here and have a guy like here in the foreground looked like he would be doing something like you know what I mean they were moving around and then you would have this guy his scale you'd have then a bunch of other guys all down around here moving parts of the ship or boxes or whatever and, and moving goods you know so he might be here and then I could just immediately imagine like a, a hangar bay or something like that there's a some type of a structure And that Star Wars shape language, right? Hanging over. There, can you see that? Mm -hmm. So now we're, we're building around. So we have the ship first, right? Yeah. And then we have this large Star Wars-ish overhangy. And they're really good about using, you know, we, we're, you, we were talking about this with the mechs and stuff, with Daniel, mm -hmm. about using acute and obtuse angles and making things look a little bit different. Mm -hmm the way they put in some of their detail and throw little angles and stuff. <clears throat> so if I do this and put that around, you know what I should have done is put that on a separate layer, but I can copy and paste it. Yeah. So I come in back here. There might be, I was like putting these little lights like around the edge or something. Helps overlap part of the shape. Yeah. That'd be a foreground. That's your block. Yeah. yeah. See, that'd be my. <clears throat> exactly. So when you leave, you go back up there and you circle, right? You caught it right there. Because that's their. <clears throat> so, mother, yeah, it'd be more at an angle like that or something. Maybe that comes out a little. Yeah, so that would be. That's how it would block in. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, and, but you can see it working now, where now I have, there's my large, right? There's my shape. Is Now, the only thing I need to do is figure out, I have a little bit of combative between, let me just draw on it real quick, look at the size of that versus the size of that. So they're a little close to being equal, so I need to find a way, to me, what I would want to do there is I would want to keep this, oops, I'd want to keep this um, detail 
going to make this the larger element. So then it definitely reads large, medium, small. Maybe this has a Sliding around here a little bit. There. So now, <coughs> if I could make that the larger part, right? And then we can enclose it. Yeah. Yeah, I could even enclose it. I could put a hole if I wanted to imagine if I had a wall that came down like this. Okay. Now that becomes the large, and then that's the medium. So it, it doesn't nearly have as much. Um, I didn't like going into the ship. It probably would feel better to come this way and go out that way. And then imagine if that was like space or just something in the back. That could be anything. There could be a door behind there, right? So now that's large, medium, small. And to me, so I think that was good. I'm glad we caught that. I was recording when I got that because now we have the ship being the dominant. We are, excuse me, we started with the ship, but it, the ship, the fact that we started with the ship itself, it's the dominant shaper, you know? It's almost like you did medium, <laughs> small, and then you built everything. Yeah. 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 So, and then even when you draw the ship, that's why he brought this sketchbook. Is when I'm drawing those little shapes, mm -hmm. I'm still thinking about large, medium, small. Mm -hmm. So it's a large, medium, small transitioning into the ship shapes. Mm -hmm. It transitions in the way you design the rest of your composition. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually glad because usually I would be at home and I would not have the recorder on. But see that to me, that's a good composition that I could work off of because all I'd have to do is go into this right now and basically render out the ship itself. So if I just thought of the ship as a separate prop with a little bit of light maybe coming in that direction, mm -hmm. that could be rendered. That could have the guy there, and I could have the other workers, yeah. and that's it. And then, like, you know? small lights <laughs> in the back of the wall or something. Yeah, you could, there could be something there. I could even have a little light up there. I could have a little right. lights there, another one on the back here. Yeah. You can repeat some little motifs. Like, I could have lines, or sometimes I do this thing. I learned this from, like, Robotech and Macross. They'll have a little triangle part that jets out like this mm. every time, and then they have a line that goes behind it like that. Mm. And as you see it just repeating, mm. so it reinforces what's in the background there. Mm. So there might be another one like right here. Okay. Come in there, another little light type of thing. <coughs> That's it. So that would be a good, another fun example of just building around the prop itself. Oh, you know? Two, like a two-point. Yeah. So ima imagine we could do that same thing here. Imagine we do another low level, and imagine having this really cool... This is like the transition, <coughs> so you're basically making it like the guy's going to get on the Exactly. It is in two-point, right. and because of that, you, you nailed it, though. It doesn't make you feel like you're either coming or going. Either they're landing, dropping off goods, or something important, but the fact that there's guys here and there's guys around it makes it look like they're working on it, and that's the shot you would see in storyboards before somebody takes off and then flies out somewhere else. So if you just tilted this, it would be more action-oriented. Yeah. So that's actually a good point. I didn't want to show anyone to do that. Was because here yeah. we can here. Just copy that later. <laughs> here, watch. Let's do that down here. Yeah. Let me hit Command Z. <clears throat> that's a good. It, let's do that as our next shot. Let's set up an action shot. Okay. So, but let's make sure the first thing we're going to do is let me label this, put it on a separate layer. <clears throat> One of the biggest problems I see when students set up an action shot is. They're draw, they're, they start drawing at turn, mm. and you can't do that. Mm. Let me, oh, here, let me sort of throw a little grid on here. They draw it at a turn angle, and it's just so much harder to do that. <coughs> so let's say we have that, mm -hmm. and then let's put another layer up here. <coughs> and we'll go, <coughs> we'll just do a vehicle. And we'll do another vehicle, duplicate that layer. Okay, so let's put, um, what I'm going to do here is, let me just turn this off. Hold on, vehicle here. I'm going to put a dot. What I'm going to do is create a, I'm going to imagine there being a vanishing point here on my vehicle. I'm going to turn off the grid now. <clears throat> so I'm just going to imagine that I have some form of a horizon line. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to see if I can't sketch a vehicle with that type of line of action. 
going. Oh, like a gesture. Yeah, so I'm above the horizon line. I'd be slightly like looking up at it. And I have really no idea. I'm just throwing this out of my noggin right now. Yeah, it's yeah. bing, boom, boom, right? Yeah. And try to keep that. So I'm imagining there's a wing here. There's maybe an engine thingy here. And then maybe it's in two points, so then maybe there's a offset. And picture there's another. Okay, let's say that's vehicle sort of one. I really wanted to push one wing to be larger. Yeah. Let me accentuate that so it does maybe it feels the same way in the back as well. Okay, so let's say I have vehicle one there. And then real quick, I just see that angle. So I'm going to sort of memorize that angle because this other one... I don't want to be on that same angle. I want to see if I can maybe counter angle yeah. a little bit. Okay. So let me see if I can get something if my horizon line's about there. <clears throat> there. Okay. okay. So now if I turn them both on. Okay, and then if I come to the grid, the grid is the key. Because then if I take the grid now and if I turn the grid, oh, see, and if I throw the grid at an angle yeah. like that, yeah. what it does is it's counter angle. So you have the grid at an angle and then you have these opposite angles. Then all I have to do is put something in here to show that they're chasing each other somehow. So I could lock. So I need to get this guy. <laughs> so let's say if I counter angled him. Hold on. This just popped in my head. But if I duplicate this layer, okay, I'm going to bring it up here and I take that and I'll flip it vertically. So I'm going to imagine that being somewhere like this. Because see, it does, it allows me to create depth. What I need to be careful of is this other ship right here. Hmm. I might need to move closer to show, make it look like. So now I'm looking at this and I sort of don't like that perspective. But what I was thinking is imagine if I had both grids. And then I turn the grids a little bit like this. <coughs> so you're thinking this ship should go further in the background, right? Like to push Actually, I want to bring it. I think I might want to bring it closer. Oh. And then I might want to change the perspective of that. So if I take this ship and I put it maybe a little bit more in my foreground. Oh, okay. And now if I take this guy here, I just need to adjust his perspective a little bit more. So if I take him and if I go to transfer, let's go to distort. And maybe I bring them up a little bit more. And maybe I find a way to overlap them somehow. Actually, then what if I flip them? Oh, so you're trying to put them both in the mid-ground? You're trying to put both ships in the mid-ground? No, I wanted to keep one in the back and then one further away. Oh, okay. So I just wanted to, to show that, like, if this guy was racing forward, so maybe I would need to do something like maybe there's something hanging from up here. Like maybe there's, this, you know, like structures or antennas or something mm. coming from here. And then you can really feel that this guy's in the foreground. And then that might help push this guy back here further off in the background. Actually, I don't like the perspective on that now. Now I'm looking at that, and I'm like, I would take that ship out okay. completely. So let me just do that. Let's delete him. <coughs> but that's a good, that's how we got there, right? We realized it wasn't working or fitting. So if I have... Elements here. Oops. And then if I were to repeat part of that shape, maybe I end up having it. Here, I'm just going to stick to my vanishing point. <coughs> so if I get that ship about there. Oops. Okay, and then if I come back here, let's put another layer in the back, because that is matching there. 
what if actually back here I could have the ship like it's just if he's angled like that what if there's the other ships like back in here somehow Think of a cool ship shape. And maybe they're like chasing, but then this part of the composition opens up a little bit. So I could put them here, make them a little bit larger. And I could come back here and make this guy a little bit smaller. Actually, the shapes are too similar, so it needs to be, I want this ship to be way larger. Problem is, I'm just throwing a sh ship out of my head. I don't know if it's really making sense. Why is it not erasing? Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Let's combine those. Uh -oh. oh, come on, why is it? Hold on. Yep, thank you. Okay, so then here, if if I make, I just want need this to feel like a larger ship. There, so that feels better. It looks more like a ship shape with large wings, and they're coming by. It's a little close. It's still a little cropped up here, but I could expand out. See, now I want to erase more. Let's move it all together into one. See what emerged together. Excellent. So if I take this, I want to move it over a little bit more in the composition, like that. And I might take this guy, move him out a little bit more. Why is it not? That's why I'm both layers. <laughs> so the one thing that I would want to do definitely in this composition is look if this is if I have angles there I want a counter angle so that one's going sort of in an angle like that to me that ship would be better drawn if it was counter angled like that makes sense so they're counter to each other but <laughs> for right now just for the the sketch I could just finish it off maybe there's another structure that's coming in perspective it's part of like this whole Still looks further back though. Maybe I need to bring it. What if I brought that structure out a little bit more? I think I, I might start another one. I'm not liking the way this one's going. But there, if I overlap it a little bit, that brings them a little closer. So are they you're <coughs> trying to get them to meet like they're flying towards each other, right? Or I was actually thinking he was chasing, chasing this okay. guy yeah. and this yeah, guy's flying into this like little cave oh, okay. yeah. type of thing. That's what I was sort of going for yeah. <clears throat> and trying to get the counter angles in there. Mm. <clears throat> but now I'm looking at it and I'm sort of second guessing. I guess for the first sketch, I guess it's all right, but I know I can make it better. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you just know that as an artist when you throw something on paper sometimes. You could come back. So I'm trying to make the shapes be the large shape would be all the surrounding, sure. then medium, small sure. type of thing. So now I want to go back into that and structure and build off of that composition, do another version. All right, it's a starting point. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can't. I mean, for me, I look at that and I go like, okay, I know things I need to fix on it and work. I'd want to adjust that counter angle. Um, so, what would help me to a solution to that would be coming here 
and let's look through and find one of their chase sequences and see exactly <coughs> how they sort of staged it. <coughs> There's that one in the beginning that yeah, was here. The yeah, the X-Wing, exactly. Yeah, like yep. There it is. That's a good one, though. Yeah. Oh, that one's banked. Yeah. That's two point. Let me see, where is it? Looking at the small images down here, it's way in, that was in the very beginning. Yeah, there. Yeah. So I love how this is, look, all this is going back into one point, right? <coughs> back there. And then you have this at an angle, and that it's almost like the angle's animating. You see that? Mm. I think that's pretty cool. So that gives me a better idea. Maybe if I had a flat wall and I had the shape, maybe the shape in front of me does, for scale, have to be a lot larger of a ship and then smaller ships and then reinforce it with a perspective, something in yeah, see, this is perspective this behind it. So yeah. It's, it's, it's like animated. Yeah, it is. I mean, you, look at that feel. It's like you, you can almost feel them coming out of the bank mm -hmm. and you can see the angles coming through. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, when you take a car around a turn mm -hmm. and you know what it's going to do. It's, I mean, that's really great how it, how they staged that up there. So that gives me a better idea. I go back and then also there was, there's a couple others. That's really yeah. cool too. Look at that huge angle, and then that counter angle right there. So you would, that's how you would have designed it. You would have designed these three, the, the, the angles of the ships, mm -hmm. and then that's it. You would just build this circle around yeah. it, right? Yeah. Okay. So you wouldn't even. So it's hard to see here where your ground plane is. Yeah. So you're getting the the Dutch tilt from your. Yeah, but you ship. even though you can't tell though, you can tell in general. We're looking down on top of the sphere because you can see the ellipse right here. And if we're looking down on top of the sphere and knowing that, then we could come in here and you can say, okay, at this thing. And this is a tough one because I had another piece I sketched once for a chase sequence when I was working on the Lego Bionicles project. I had these ships flying in space as they were coming down into a building. Mm -hmm. So you have a ground plane. So technically you're looking down. You can imagine, you know, that sphere would be above something. But then you got to find the angle at which the ship is going and just find a vanishing point where that yeah. makes sense. To so you can picture the ground plane <coughs> way down here. Exactly. Tilted that and then if you tilt oh. that ship, this being tilted, if you look at it like this, if I were to draw, here, let me save this That's picture. Right. This is what gives you the indication of where the horizon and the ground plane is. Yeah. Like but th again, this is one of the benefits. I mean, to really get some of this under your belt. Oops, what did I just do? Because once, well, once you do the Dutch tilt on these shapes, you can't. This one won't tell you. This can't tell you much, but some other items. This is how I would break this piece up, or how I would look at it. Number one, one of the things that I always see when I look at this. Let me go to red. Is that if you look at that angle that's in there, mm -hmm. and then you know in perspective that's about the the right okay. angle. So what I would do is I do this. Is I would find where that's sort of going. And I would just draw this as a plane, a, a single squared plane. So if you look at it, that's all that is, is the plane there. And then what this is, is this is the same thing. That's just another square that's existing there, square, square. In fact, what if you wanted to add another ship in? Mm -hmm. You could come in here and just draw it as a square. Mm -hmm. and you could add that square in there. And that actually, that could help you create that, right, the trench run. that animation angle where mm -hmm. it looks like the ships are banking and coming in to a, a, attack and we could tell since we're looking on top of that ellipse that we're you know so everything sort of makes sense there mm -hmm. and then they just dropped in that the rest of that round element but like what would be really cool is this what if we took this mm -hmm. that's right here what if we took that away mm -hmm. and then we just imagined that this is a structure that we're looking down on and this is a desert underneath it like that does that make sense mm -hmm. And this would be all a desert ground plane. You could do that too. Right. I mean, you could easily take something that exists. Right. Or you can make this a gigantic <clears throat> hole in the bottom. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine this being like small little people here in little buildings down there. And then you have this ship that's banking here. And then there's one banking there. Just put the center lines on the ship mm -hmm. so you can see what's happening. Heck, you could even you could have those coming in. You could even come over here. You could have another ship banking up here going this way. So it looks like they're all flying in to attack. And then look, all we got to do is make that grid smaller. If we make that grid a little bit smaller, what it's going to do is it's going to give you the feeling 
um, that, that we're looking down on top of a desert plain. And so all we would have to do to really make that work is you just come in here to the structure, make sure the structure is small. It has like, a, you know, a little entryway, whatever, door. You know, it has little windows, whatever. There might be speeders, other ships outside. Maybe there's some rocks that lead us to this. It's sort of around <coughs> part of this base. Maybe there's like little antennas or whatever on the side. Maybe it is, you know, what if it's actually, what if it's on a, like compositionally, what if it's a cliff? Because mm -hmm. then that brings us back into the right. shape, right? Yeah. So imagine now we have a ship here, mm -hmm. is yeah. that, yeah. and then you could see the ships coming down. But then look, after that cliff drops, mm -hmm. then what do you have down here? You have another grid for the rest of you know, look at another. So now you have the ships banking in, mm -hmm. and you can see. So you could actually, I mean, that's a great example of yeah. just stealing a composition where you literally can go in there yeah. and take something that already exists, add to it, and develop. I mean, that would totally work right there. Because yeah. look, you still have large. The large is the whole entire base of the planet. Your medium construction then is that ship, and then your smaller these other little scale items. So this is pointing off. What would you? What would you? What would you? Oh, of blocking it, yeah. the point of return? I, I t think you could do a couple things compositionally. You might be able to, well, if it was Star Wars-ish, you could have like as this, and then you could have just a sky dropping in the back. You could put oh, the, like you the, could, like yeah, you could even put the same equal, like there's a gorge, and then look, now you have, hold on, my stupid erase is in Oregon. Imagine if I had another cliff on the backside here. And then this drops like this. Oh, it's a block. That's your backdrop. That's yeah. Your backdrop. So this would be, you were like in these canyons. Yeah. And you could see the canyons, and you could see like the canyons are dropping down like this. So there's that gridded plane. And then here across this, you just go there, there's another part of the canyon. So the canyon just keeps going off. And then the canyon walls are like this. Yeah. So you could easily, you could totally do that as a composition. And then you could even have like a bigger shape here, like a silhouette, like a foreground element of this thing. You could. You could have another ship yeah. coming here, but yeah. then you got to be careful of your large. Right. Because right now right. your large is the background medium and you have your small there. Right. So that's like adding yeah. two. <coughs> or what you could do is, what you just nailed it though, is you, you could do a little bit of both. So what if we come in here, let's take out that large ship shape. I mean, that's just a plane, right? Mm. So what if we come in here and put this back so it looks like it's oh, yeah, I see. so now we're back to where we were we have ships flying over we have this gridded world like this mm -hmm. and now <clears throat> what if we want to make the we have that plane in an angle what if it's you know I don't know what if that we see this large shape flying in like this right. you know or maybe it's it has to come forward a lot more than that what if it's oops there. So what if we see this shape? We're still looking down on it. What if we see that yeah. coming in? And then we make it even a little bit larger. Right. So that becomes our ship now, too. Right. So still bring Large, and then it looks like there's still, yeah. Now we just come in here. It's a little hard to see with all those other trace lines under it. So let's erase that and think of it as just a large plane. like this with a center line down the middle like that yeah. so that would totally work yeah. so then i could just come in here yeah. see that totally works too it kept the same thing so we just changed the composition and this actually is cool because it does look if i did do this i'd probably broaden this a little larger mm -hmm. so it's fitting the scale because you would put your detail in that right since this guy's a foreground um or you would put more i would put more detail in this because okay. to me that would be maybe a little yeah. closer okay. He's down a little bit, and then he gets smaller. So now you can see it looks like there's ships flying in, and they're going to attack part of this. So basically you had, like, three <laughs> compositions already, like your first sketch, and then the second one, yeah. this guy, and then you have the third. Yeah, I mean, you, and you could, keep, you could modify this up. <clears throat> okay. What if you wanted to change it more? What if you wanted to take out the ships, make the large base, mm -hmm. and then have something else? I mean, they do uh, down shots. When I was looking at, there's this one in here let me go find it real quick mm -hmm. it's the one we're looking at like all the i mean that's a great down shot you'll notice they use a lot of down shots when they're in space mm -hmm. looking down on stuff that one right there 
So that's pretty high your horizon line. Look at that whole base. And then this one is great because look at how high that horizon line is. So we have that large base shot here, <coughs> you know. Yeah. So that's the two-point transitional, right? Yeah, I mean, well, it depends. You, <coughs> Yeah, when you look at this, I mean, the rocks are in two's point. This building's, most of these buildings are all in two point, but it does sort of cheat and go into a little bit of a one point, that, but that's still in an angle that goes to vanishing point there. And so you have a point here directly above another point over there. <coughs> but to me, how I would look at this shot is, is even though it's two point, you might be like, oh, it's transition. To me, that reads like a one point with the angles going this way because we see one main vanishing point side here. Here, let me download that image and let's draw on top of it. It is, right? This is some of the, the golden stuff about, you know, so much. That's so why I was telling students mimicking and looking at other artists' work is not, uh, they're like, no, I'm a tracer. You're copying. No, it's not. You, this is how you learn from other artists and masters and people that came before you, right? You need to really examine their work. Okay, so look, <clears throat> technically, okay, so let me just draw on it. Let's take off this layer. Yes, it is a two-point, but let's look at what's happening here. You have lines going this way. You have another set of lines going over here. You have lines coming back up in here. You have this converging back over there. That's converging back over there. Okay, it's so on the rocks, right? <clears throat> you, you, well, the rocks and part of the wall. these walls and okay. stuff. Everything's converging, which looks like a one point. Okay. So they, you know, if you had all of these being horizontal, it might throw off part of the the look of the, it's out of the cone of vision, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, by slightly angling another vanishing point, these feel a lot more comfortable, mm -hmm. like square. So to me, I don't know, I still, to me, that's just like a nice establishing shot. Mm -hmm. I've seen establishing shots. I mean, I guess what I'm getting at, if you look, there's a vanishing point just a couple inches above that's still in the frame. It, it's not the frame, it's right not outside the of the frame, right but it's the right here, right. and it's right sort of yeah. like to the left-hand side. It's right about here, probably, just right. up a couple inches. Yeah. So if you have one vanishing point there, then the other one's way off the page because everything's going way this way, so and it's, close enough it's another way. frame over. So, yeah, it, it's yeah. somewhat similar to one point, but it's just a nice establishing shot, and that's one of the things. Remember in environment design, I talked about that, keeping one point in the side around the frame hmm. and another point a frame or two off hmm. it it sort of feels like one point but it settles the piece a little bit you know i mean this is great though i mean compositionally look at how it it moves you where you know you're looking here and then you move back here and then you have and then there's these organic elements that are swaying you around you know and you're coming back around like this you know and then you before you even think you could leave you have all of this up here that, that balances it off. It's, a, it's just, a, a, just a great composition. But narratively, it's like big, medium, small. And That's right. This is one, two, three. And yeah. This and you, yeah, this might even be, this here might be the largest shape, right. you could say. Sure. Well, it depends on what you look at. You could say the environment's the large shape. Sure. Sure. Or you could say that's large. And then you could say you have all this, which is pretty good yeah. shape. All that to there, that's medium. And then, and then your small is just these two little jawas for scale overlapping. You know, or excuse me, the third guy here that's blended in, but he's blended in. You don't even see yeah. him, but he's there. And, and I think there's a reason for that, because if you didn't blend him in, you would be maybe competing with that shape on the left. Interesting. See what I mean? So, I mean, to me, that's the read I get, even though you don't realize there is a jaw wall that's right there hiding, you know, sort of blended in. Right. Yeah. But great, great composition. So, again, that's something that anyone could build off of. Heck, you could take this, take these buildings, make the buildings smaller, and then you could throw in a couple ships like they're coming down to land and the composition would still work, hmm. you know? So I think there's really a lot to learn compositionally. Um, I mean, God, could you imagine us doing this day in and day out, how much you would pick up and learn? Because, you know, we is I think we look at these pieces and you take them for advantage sometimes. Where you're like, oh, I could do that, or hey, that's you know, that's just one point. But look at the large shapes that are in there, and the way it reads, and <clears throat> what, how it communicates. You know, it's pretty cool stuff. Okay, cool. That was fun. Yeah. I'm gonna stop the recorder. Okay. I, I wish there was a way on this piece. If you could imagine, 
the uh, the ship's not there. Okay, so let, let let me let me do that for a minute. So all it's really what's basically happening. You have, hold on, let's go to brush, and let's go to blue. Okay, if you could follow this, there's a a grid happening here. Sorry, I keep getting a slip. See the grid? There's a grid going back in perspective there. Does that make sense? So you can tell right now, where's the horizon line looking at this grid? Where's the one line that's like completely horizontal? That's right here. See that line right there? It's completely horizontal. Once we go above the grid, this line is receding back in this direction. So the vanishing point is, look at my cursor. Where did my cursor go? Here, can you see my cursor? Here, let me go to a V. There. So the vanishing point's about right over here on the right side of the page. Make sense? <clears throat> so all that is is a grid. Okay, now let me turn off the grid. Let's go back. And then <clears throat> all I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this guy. Let me draw him as cubes. Going back to the same vanishing point, but just twisting what's happening. Okay, so if we come back here. Okay, see that cube that that uh, TIE fighter exists in? <clears throat> now this is a little bit longer, this is a little bit trickier, but here I'll just treat it in the shape that it's in, which is a simple cube. The back does go a little bit more because then you have these little triangular shapes that are going into it. That's just a raise in the canopy. Okay. So you have a cube in the back. You have a cube up in the front. Let me draw this in part in red. There is a feeling of... <coughs> you already see the difference in those angles? Those angles, that's what Mark and I were talking about, they imply like movement. Like, look at my hands real quick. If something's chasing something else and this thing banks, that's at a different angle now and this is pitched like this. As that comes into the turn, it's going to bank. So you, that's something that they, they do in animation sometimes. One of the principles of animation is you look at like a character that's running or like an animal. When the animal's running and turning, the line, the animal sort of adjusts its weight inside and it sort of acts these turns a little bit, right? So it hugs that turn. So it's the same thing that you can do with ships and vehicles. If you understand where it's flowing and turning into, you could do that. And there's a couple different ways that you can do that. One way, I worked with a storyboard artist once. His name is Fred Lucky. And what Fred taught me was that create a ribbon. Does that make sense? A giant path. So if you create a ribbon, here, let me turn this off and I'll show you what I mean. Fred was um, in animation and he was responsible for staging fight sequences all the time. And he worked on Mulan and a bunch of other movies. So what he meant by that was do something like this. If you have, create another layer. If you draw a ribbon in perspective that goes like this and then let's say our ribbon turns and goes like that. Do you see that path of the ribbon? So you know you could have, you can draw a ship here coming in and then as that ship hits into that path it's going to turn that way and then as the ship starts to bank out of that path the center line is going to be like this. 
Make sense? So you can draw something turning along that pathway if you draw the ribbon and understand how the object is morphing in perspective and turning, which isn't too complex, right? Just think of drawing a big ribbon. So if you come back to that, that's somewhat similar where you have something else chasing something else. And if you've ever seen cars and chase sequences in, or vehicles, especially planes like Top Gun, you see them always doing this where they're like shifting angles. That's just to make it look better. Usually professional pilots probably just tail right on them, but then they, they do that. So you have these nice, what I call counter angles. So even when you're drawing an environment, if you counter angle things, it makes it more interesting than having everything being on the same angle. So you could have like the interior of a library and if everything's perfectly horizontal, it feels boring. If you tilt something a little bit or have a book hanging off an edge and counter angle, it'll feel better. So you have basically those shapes that are existing on this, uh, not on that, but on this perspective grid right there. Okay. That make sense? Could you draw the ribbon that the ships are following? Um... Yeah, pretty much. I think the ribbon, let's do this. Let me drop, let's take the grid and we'll drop the grid down really low so we have an idea where the horizon line is. And basically, you have to think of it as two. This ribbon might be a little bit off. Huh? Oh, and there's also, yeah, hold on. There's a third TIE fighter in there in the back. Do you see it? It's hard to see. Here, let me draw them real quick. So let me come back to here. And so... It's very tiny here. I'm going to draw the red for it right now. So the third TIE fighter, oops, is right here. So let me draw his box. Uh, he's just turned in an angle like that, basically. Okay, so now let's take off the back. So do you see that other fighter? So basically, you can see this is what part of that ribbon is, is that, so... Uh, all objects have a major and minor axes, right? So let's, we're, right now we're going to do with the axes that's going this way, that's going horizontally. Sorry, I keep switching the wrong color, going like this. So those are turning this way, and it might look like he was coming down from this direction. And then when he's coming here, he's going to start to bank into that position. And then after he's banking there, it doesn't look like he's then going to bank from there and go into that position. That would be that ribbon. That's part of the flow in that piece. There, does that make sense? You can see it, right? <laughs> so that's the great thing about perspective. You just have a grid. Like in this room, this room's in one point, but objects still exist in two point. They're just turned. So you could have, you, you could just draw the best. So what you could do is you could go into any drawing and you could just start with, where is it? What do I do with the dang grid? There it is on the bottom. You could start right there with just the grid. <coughs> if I come back to that grid, I could come into that and I could do my own ribbon. I could do something going maybe in another direction or an opposite way. I could come in, it doesn't matter here, I could just draw on top of it and call these boxes. So what if I had something coming, going this way? What if I have, here let me draw a ribbon real quick. What if my ribbon looked like this? What if something was coming up and then hitting here and then it was dropping and going down getting smaller? Like that, right? So there would be my ribbon going along the side of the building. So my main axis line is going to be going across right here, correct? And I can draw then a vehicle that would exist in that shape. It would be right here. Okay, so even if I were to go into some little details, let's say I had a front to the vehicle, let's say there's a back, let's say there's little engines here, let's say there's little wings that come off the side, that could be <coughs> part of the front of the vehicle. And then I can get back up here and I could find, now I could tilt it a little bit. 
I could take my axes. What if I turn it a little bit more? Because he's chasing. Maybe this guy is trying to lose him. Right? And I'm going to have that right there as they're banking over the ribbon. And then as they're dipping down here, I'm going to be able to see part of that ship being right there. Does that make sense? So there, that would be my ribbon. So do you see how I could totally change the, the, the counter angle of that vehicle in opposite direction? It would, it would be chasing after them. And I could still put the same environment in the back. And that's one of the things Mark and I were doing earlier when we were talking up here. I was doing some sketches and we were just, we were designing the world around the prop. So if you were to draw the prop like landed, you could then literally build a base around it. You know, and that's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You can do that. That's a practice that a lot of people do. I have another demo on my YouTube site where I'm doing the same thing that I did for CGMA. It's a really big detailed base, with like three ships taken off. I went and I drew the ships first and you could build off of it. But here, does that make sense how the ribbon works? The ribbon's great because actually that ribbon, all it is, is the same principle in animation when we had to do what we call the, a character animation pathway. It's just turned to the side. So in animation, one of the things you had to do when you were a traditional layout artist was this, is you would have an environment, let's say you had an environment like this, and you had a road that came in, let's say there was a front door to a house, and here's the house. So one of the things a rough layout artist had to do is you had to draw the environment, but then for the animators, you had to come in here and you had to explain the character is this tall right here, the character is going to be that tall right there, and then as they round this corner, and get to that front door, the character is going to be that tall. All that is is the ribbon turned vertically instead of horizontally. I, I just never, I, to me it is a ribbon, even though that's not how I learned it in animation because that was one of the first jobs I had to do was character layout where we would, someone would draw like the big environment then you had to go in and draw the environment for the animators to match all the the perspectives on it. And when I worked on the Adam Sandler movie, that was huge because we had to draw the positions of where Adam would be and then the animators would get it. They throw, they look at your sheet for scale and then they go in there and what they do, basically this is where key posing comes from, is you then would draw the character here in a key pose, maybe his arms walking this way, you know, his other arms walking back. Then you have the other, you have the character here in a key pose, walking maybe his foot's this way and that way. And then he gets here to the door and rings the doorbell. So those are all the key poses. The animator would draw the key poses, and then after that, you do the in-betweens. And it's actually, if you think about it, when you go back to this, and we're looking at that, part of that action is just the key pose of the ships, and your brain's filling in all the other information of what's happening in between that pose and the, the takeoff, okay? All right? And then let's, um, on this one, this is actually, <coughs> it's a little, not really a, a trick or anything it's quite simple the only thing that's happened here is you have the ground plane is at a tilt it's on a hill that's it that's your perspective that's all it is it's just a hill it's an angled hill and then if I put another layer on top the characters here's the funny part is the characters are all matching perspective. They're all standing vertically. Because when you, if you ever, something you probably don't realize, but if you go stand on a hill and you're up on a hill, you're standing vertically on the hill. You don't stand at an angle. You walk up and you still stand to understand that. So if you take off this and you look, that's the character's height and scale relationships. In fact, you can measure that distance from there and you can go back. Oops, a little bit of slip there. If we go back to the very back here, that's the characters being smaller. So all this really is, is a transfer of scale, where we go from there. And if we come back here, so we're going this way first, okay? We're going that way from the character in the front, and then we come here, and then as the characters recede over the hill, they get smaller. That's it. So that's, that ribbon there, that's the character height or what I call the character scale. So is, your, is the hill basically the horizon? Uh, no. Technically, if you look at the whole entire piece, 
your your horizon line in this piece would probably be about hold on let me go to what red your horizon line in this piece is about right there but we're just on a hill you could have hills or just angled planes so it's angling downward and this particular hill rounds off and we don't see anything in the back besides that so that's just a great composition because when you look at this if i go back and take that line off and take these off what is that introducing angles like that into a piece um what does that make you feel like when you see that composition is that happy time no it's in angles. Anytime you introduce angles into a scene, it means something's going to happen, somebody's going to die, or someone's going to sneak up on somebody and rob them and kill them. That's what the angles are there for. That's the, it's like the golden rule. That's why when I look at when I look at <laughs> student storyboards and they're showing me a storyboard and they show a character sneaking up on another character, or there's a battle and the horizon lines flat and all, there's a problem in your staging. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, because it's all right. You, as soon as stuff starts to happen and chase scenes and action, you need to get a, a, what they call a Dutch tilt involved in part of the angles. It adds to the emotional content of the scene. Did you see season three of Stranger Things? I have not seen season, season three. I'm still on two. Okay, because there's a scene where, like, they're arguing with someone and it's getting more and more intense and then the guy like kicks a trash can and the I, the camera actually tilts like in the same scene like it goes into a dutch angle without changing like without yeah it like, just tilts yeah because that's exactly that's the director's way of him telling you like hey um something's really gonna happen yeah. right now and it ain't good yeah. boom and it goes until they do the same thing you go look at alien movies you go look at everything this is just good old i wish brian murray was here i, I should bring him in one day and we should talk about because even though this is digital paint, part of digital paint is this narrative of how to set up the scenes. Because if you don't set up the scenes and you don't know the perspective correctly, this is why the, the one class that's always skipped here at this school, everyone wants to skip perspective. They want to skip over it and they want to go right into the painting and the rendering. And to me, it, it's crazy. I have two sessions and they're all filled now for this session this next semester it's the most important class that you can have because it covers all this and by the way we just wrote a class just for this brian and i did and it just passed through the state it's uh, i'll probably teach it next term it's perspective for staging and storyboarding it's all about setting up scenes like this and what we would do in that class would be imagine if i were to tell you okay there's going to be a chase scene that's going to happen you're going to have to give me the seven key frames that are going to be in that chase scene so you have beginning and end and then you have to give me the five frames that go in the middle. And you have to change it. And the angles are going to change. Everything's going to start to modify. If you go into storyboarding and you know that, and you can pre-plan and think about angles, I mean, a huge part of perspective, excuse me, storytelling and narrative and staging is all about what's happening with your angles inside the perspective views that you're displaying to them. How do you set up that shot? You know? Does that help you? Yeah, I love this. I could do this stuff all day because you just, you look at, there's the ribbon and then there's the grid plane and you're like, dude, that ain't that hard. The problem is, is when you're looking at this, that's not what you're seeing. When you're looking at this, you know what your eye's doing? Your eye's looking at those clouds and your eye goes, oh my God, like, they look like cotton candy, but blue. And it's, they look so pretty and they're rendered and they look realistic. And look at the gradients on there. The gradients are awesome. And look at this guy. He's got these three large, I don't even know what those are feathers hanging out of his back right he's got his weapons and he's on this animal and he's going to go attack and there's other troops it's nicely staged it's very cinematic that's excellent but your eye that's the problem is all the all young students look at that stuff and they're not looking at this which is the makeup and they're not looking at figuring that part of that out now i'm thinking about what i should do in perspective class i should just add a whole section on understanding what we call the ribbon the difference between vertical ribbons and horizontal ribbons. And that basically, the analogy I usually give in the perspective class is Tron. When they're on the speed bikes and they go and it leaves that trace behind the speed bike, that scale going in the beginning and then as they get smaller, it goes all the way to the back. But that's also the same principle of part of understanding a ribbon. Okay? So, <clears throat> what you could do is you could even do this. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm still fighting this stupid cough. So check this out. You could come over here. Let me zoom in here. You could take this piece, and let's let me make sure I have different layers there. Okay, there I have a layer there. Oops, we don't want it in red. 
We want it back in blue. So look, you could come in here and we could do this. And this is sort of what Eric was just talking about. We can put a one point perspective <coughs> view in here. <coughs> okay. Now I'm going to call this real quick and let me label this grid. And then let's come in here. And what I'm going to do <coughs> is I'm going to come in here with red and I'm now going to throw in a ribbon that matches part of this angle of view here. My ribbon is going to come in like this in an angle. Okay, so there's my ribbon right there. Okay, so imagine now if I have a ship drawn right here. I'm looking up at it. It's coming down at an angle. It's in a box. And then I might come over here and I'm going to just counter angle it a little bit. I'm going to have the same ship or another ship. It's chasing, banking off right there. And then just to do something that they would probably do in Star Wars, I'm going to come over. I'm going to duplicate that ribbon sort of right over here, but this time I'm going to maybe make it look like this other ship is smaller, is going to go the other direction. Like that. See that? So there I have three ships. Now, here comes the magic. Ready? Dun, da, dun. Now I put a little Dutch tilt on it. There it is. There's your action scene. Make sense? Was that complicated? No, it was super easy. In fact, here, how about we do this? <coughs> Let's duplicate that. Transform, let me flip it upside down. Uh oh, what did I just do? I flipped it the wrong way. Flip it vertically. This is a great thing about Photoshop. Look, I can match up that same perspective right there. But what I can do is I'm going to cheat now. It's on the same vanishing point. You see that, right? Here, I can erase from here. To there. I'm going to erase all of that that's in there, but see how the vanishing points matched up? Then I can take both the grids and turn it, and now you have ships fighting on the Death Star going between the like canyons or whatever. Make sense? You could go in there now, and that's your foundation. I could go in there and build off of this piece. <coughs> so all I have to do <coughs> is I could come in here, let me go back to blue. Let me get my brush back to, wait, hold on, brush. That's not my drawing brush. Why is it not working? Oh, there it goes. It's just a lag because of the recorder still on. So what I could do now is, is I could now use things to my advantage. So look, I have a slight tilt on there. So, oops, I went blue, not that. So imagine if I have a stalag, might. No, which one comes from the ground? Still like tight, might. might. Always forget. Might comes from the ground. Tight. From, yes, thank you. That's what it is. So look, imagine here I come on this now and I'm just going to draw in. I might have some rocks hanging from there. I could come back into party here and make it look like this is the cave of a roof here. I might have something else in the foreground that's wrapping over like this. And then in the back here, oops, I didn't like that line. Can put a middle plane in there. <coughs> Do you see how that environment just came about? All I did was put something in the foreground and put something in the midground, and then I overlap the light thing in the background. Now I could come in <coughs> back to here. Actually, I'm looking at my grid and I want to take off this other layer right here. Okay, to give it a little bit more, but the perspective would still be matching. So then I'm going to come back here, and then I'm going to say, I'm going to imagine this turning up, and maybe there's a stalag tight sort of coming down this way. So it looks like there's an opening in that. <coughs> so it looks like they're in this cave, 
and they're, they're coming up above and they're banking down and then they're going through and they're flying out. That would set up that whole entire scene. That's it. So it didn't really take that far to get there. And this is the great thing about what I talk about in perspective all the time is that setting up that scene is just knowing the perspective first. Then I, now I could go in and draw the detail. I could go in there and do a nice line drawing. I could go into that and figure out what the shapes of the ship's going to look like and everything. You know, in fact, if you guys want, start working on that in your sketch where you're just drawing a simple ribbon going and then build stuff around it. But what Eric was saying, once you, you introduce that tilt, in fact, if I wanted to really be, uh, did I merge it? Hold on. <coughs> um, hold on, I put these on the, so let me merge these two layers. If I really wanted to live life on the, on the dangerous side, the life of an artist. I could take this and I could counter angle it like that to the piece. See that? That would make that count composition work even better because now you have the ground plane at one angle and then the, now the ceiling is counter angled to it and then you also have the angles of the ships going through. Yeah, counter angle rocks. That's really, <laughs> it does. I mean, it's the same thing if you draw an environment and you have a fence in it, you want to stagger the fence. You don't want to have everything be vertical. You have to counterangle it. So that's the same way that we can construct up that shot right there. Okay? Cool. I'm going to stop the recording.